welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that are shaping our world and inspiring future creators and for all those that like great stories. I'm Ira Pastor, your health, aging, and longevity ambassador along for this ride. So for the last few months, we've been profiling many of the cutting edge biomolecular technologies that are in the pipeline for moving us into this 21st century curative model where we can begin to have a really major impact on many of the, the chronic degenerative diseases responsible for human suffering and death. Uh, and today we're going to continue along that path in a major way. So, uh, you know, every year 65 million people leave this world to the grips of death. And, and whether those deaths are related to the diseases of aging or acute trauma, at the end of the day, whatever the initial cause, eventually it all trickles down to the the death and degeneration of our complex, critical three-dimensional organ systems that give us our daily structure and function and support us throughout our lifetime. Uh, we've discussed in the past the substantial imbalance that exists between organ supply and demand here in the US alone, and the promise of the tools of regenerative medicine and tissue engineering to bridge that gap and the potential to save endless amounts of lives in the process. Well, today's guest, who is clearly on the forefront of making this scenario reality, uh, who we're gonna discuss this topic with further, is Dr. Anthony Atala. Uh, Dr. Atala is a clinician, professor, and chair of the Department of Urology at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. He directs the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and he specializes in a variety of disciplines, including urology, microsurgery, biomaterials, stem cells, and tissue engineering. He's also director of the Institute for Regenerative Medicine, and he oversees a team of more than 400 researchers who are dedicated to developing cell therapies and engineering replacement tissues and organs, and is currently working on over 40 different areas of the body. Also directs the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine, which is a federally funded effort to apply regenerative medicine to projects including engineering blood vessels, developing treatments to heal wounds, and engineering replacement tissues for devastating injuries. Uh, he's routinely listed as one of the most influential people in biotech and healthcare, uh, has led or served on several national professional government committees, including the National Institutes of Health Working Group on Cells and Developmental Biology, the uh, National Institutes of Health Bioengineering Consortium, and the National Cancer Institute Advisory Board, uh, editor of 14 different books, including the Principles of Regenerative Medicine, uh, the Foundations of Regenerative Medicine, Medicine tissue engineering and minimally invasive urology, uh, 500 journal articles, 250 national international patents um, on the editorial board of numerous publications. Uh, Dr. Atala, uh, thank you so much for spending the time to come on our show. It's great to be with you, Ira. How are you today? Wonderful, wonderful. It's good to see you too. You know, typically we start off the show, obviously there, I, I, I would have to say no one in our industry that doesn't know who you are, but for the a person that is sort of outside of biotech that is going to be watching the show, could you just you know briefly go into a little bit about you, sort of your background, where you grew up, and sort of your journey through your know, interest in health, interest in medicine, and urology, and ultimately how in 19 you are at the global epicenter of tissue engineering and regenerative biology. Uh, well, thank you, Ira. Basically, I, uh, you know, I am trained as a surgeon and a pediatric urologic surgeon, and I did my training in Boston, uh, where I, where I actually did my subspecialty work, and that is where when I actually started doing this research uh, about 1990. And uh, since that time, just uh, have enjoyed being in this field and enjoyed uh, working in this area in regenerative medicine in a variety of tissues and organs has been fun. Excellent. And, and so your, your group, you know, you have um, at, at your lab in the center, you, you know, you develop what's called the Integrated Tissue and Organ Printing System, or ITOP, which integrates various tools, 3D printing, stem cells, uh, biodegradable biomaterials and so forth. Um, can you just talk a little about the technology? Uh, you know, also, you know, a couple of episodes ago, you might see me at Doris Taylor on from uh, Texas Heart Institute, who's as he's coming at the problem from a slightly different angle of decellularization and recellularization of existing organs. Can you just sort of walk through your system briefly and sort of compare this approach to sort of what's going on on sort of the other side of things? Absolutely. So, you know, we started working, of course, on the uh, you know, the creation of tissues and organs uh, close to 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we were creating these by hand, you know, just manufacturing these by hand, one at a time. I and mean, in fact, we also did uh, do a lot of work with decellularized organs early on, you know, especially nice. solid organs, so starting back in 1994, very early on. And uh, we basically had been applying some of these technologies to patients that we had created uh, for patients and had several of these technologies in clinical trials when, of course, it occurred to us that really 
you know, we're creating these technologies one at a time by hand. The question is, how can we really scale these technologies up? Mm -hmm. How can we really create these technologies and automate them in a way where production will be easier and more precise and less expensive? And that's really where we started looking at uh, 3D printing as a potential solution. Excellent. And you know, one of the things, obviously, that's mentioned a lot in uh, in the press and the literature about sort of the, the future potential here is uh, is the theme of vascularization. How there is this obviously we can print things, we can build them via the, these technologies. At the end of the day, uh, cells have to eat, cells have to breathe. Um, can you just talk a little bit about sort of some of the things you're working on in terms of vascularization? Because I know this is a really critical step uh, in, in sort of making most of these tools reality and, and, and moving from sort of that fully finished organ somewhere to the transplant event. Absolutely, you know, of course, we've, we've transferred a number of these technologies to patients and, and really the vascularity gets more complex as you go from the least complex to the more complex organs with the least complex structures being flat structures such as mm -hmm. skin. You know, they're a barrier uh, tissue, they're flat, they're all complex. Even skin is very complex, but it's definitely less complex than tubular structures, for mm -hmm. example, like blood vessels which are the second level of complexity because they're tubular, not flat, and they need to remain uh, open uh, you know, to air or fluid at a steady state within a physiological range. And then you have the third level of complexity, which are the hollow non-tubular organs like the stomach or the bladder. And finally, the most complex organs are the solid organs like the heart, the liver, the kidney. And as you go up that ladder, things get more complex. But in reality, you really, think about it when you're talking about flat structures tubular structures or hollow non-tubular organs mm -hmm. you're really talking about thin structures and different shapes where the vascularity is much easier to obtain once you place these structures back into the patient that is why when we launch a lot of these technologies into patients like the skin uh, or the tubular structures like urethras or hollow non-tubular organs that we place into patients these are able to be vascularized once you put them back into the patient. Mm -hmm. But for solid organs, the vascularity really does become a challenge because you have so many more cells per centimeter squared than any of the other tissue types. And now vascularity is critical for the nutrition mm -hmm. of this large volume of cells that you have with these solid organs like the heart, the liver, the kidney, the lung. And that's really where a lot of this bioprinting technology is beneficial. You know, we talked about the decellarized organs. We started working that with those back in 1994. Uh, we can uh, use discard organs. We'll use very mild detergents to wash the cells away and we can repopulate them. Or we can use these 3D printed organs that where we can create vascular channels as we print the structure. But at the end of the day, the strategy is still the same. How can you maximize vascularization, especially when it comes to solid organs? Excellent, excellent. Um, another question along that line: When you know, I look at sort of the the data that you know the United um, Organ Sharing Network has on sort of you know how many you know, ninety thousand people waiting for kidneys and you know thousands of livers and hearts and so forth, um, and then you know sort of beyond that are all of you know, what I'll call sort of the pre the pre organ failure people that you know they're not there yet, uh, but will be soon. Um, and I remember, I don't know if it was in one of your TED talks or in a lecture that you gave, but you talked about sort of this, this concept that, you know, you have to lose a substantial amount of organ function before you ultimately need uh, a transplant. And, you know, in some cases, like the liver, it has some regenerative function and so forth. I, it, it just brings me to the topic of, of something I think you may have talked about in one of these presentations about sort of organ patches, where maybe the whole organ um, is it required, but maybe we can bioengineer, tissue engineer patches for the organ. Is this something you're also working on amongst your programs still? Yeah. Right. So basically, when you really look at tissue and organ failure, the fact is that tissues and organs have, you know, a lot of give. They have a lot of reserve, if you mm -hmm. will. And therefore, the, the, the concept is, you know, can you boost some of this? functionality in some of these organs so you don't get beyond that 
critical level. So you don't get below that critical level. So really, if that translates, we should be treating patients earlier mm -hmm. to make sure that you don't get all the way to the end stage failure, but they treat patients earlier when the patients are actually on the way to end stage disease. You know, obviously I followed your work a long time. Um, I remember, you know, the work you were doing with ladders many years ago. You've, you've significantly diversified the portfolio of everything. Um, Obviously, you know, no one has the crystal ball, but if you were looking in your crystal ball, looking out 10 years, 15 years, what are you, you know, Dr. Anthony Atala, what are you most excited about? Um, and you know, what do you see as the first things hitting the market and sort of the, when you talk about sort of the scale, once you know, we really can scale these things up, what are, you, what are you most excited about? What do you think is gonna get there first? Uh, give us the sort of the, the 2040 vision. Uh, that you think about uh, as you're doing all this work? So, you know, of course, we currently have about, you know, 14 different applications of our technologies that we have now placed into patients under clinical trials, one way or the other. And these include flat structures, tubular structures, hollow non-tubular organs, and solid organs. Mm -hmm. And uh, the interesting thing about these technologies when we give them to patients is that really, you know, they require a lot of energy, a lot of work, and, and of course, uh, a lot of regulatory oversight and a lot of expenses to get it all the way, all the way to the patient so that everyone can benefit from these technologies. So we have seen in the last uh, couple of decades is getting these technologies to patients in small clinical trials and advancing those clinical trials to the phase one, phase two, eventually phase three and finally get it to the broad patient audience that we're really seeking. But few people realize how long that timeline is. Really, you know, the, from the time that you actually create the technology where you put it into the patient to the time it's finally approved is about a 15 year timeline. So it takes many years of trials to actually get these technologies out there. So for the future, what we're looking at is really how can we make sure that these technologies continue to go through that path of going through higher and higher clinical trials so everyone can benefit from them. That's number one. Number two, how can we be sure that we expand the number of patients that can receive these uh, organs? And number three, how can we make sure that we can expand the number of organs and tissues that we can offer our patients under these technologies? And when we look at some of the uh, facilitators to make that happen, we're looking at, at things that will help us to scale up these technologies in the future. Things such as 3D printing, mm -hmm. uh, added manufacturing, uh, to help also with manufacturing. And we have a lot of effort spent on the manufacturing of these technologies. We have a manufacturing consortium that we basically run here out of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which involves really accelerating the manufacturing know-how so we can manufacture these things easier, make them more reproducible, making them uh, uh, scalable uh, and uh, making them so we, there's more precision and less batch batch variability. And finally, the most important, decreasing the cost mm -hmm. uh, of these technologies for patients. So that's another area that we're looking at. So really looking at the whole spectrum of how to best get these technologies to patients sooner. One final question uh, before, and obviously you're extremely busy and you have a lot to do, uh, but we, we give this to everyone that comes on the show. Obviously, throughout your amazing career, you've, you've had the chance to work and meet uh, a lot of uh, fascinating people. Can you, uh, you name some people that were, I guess, most instrumental, most important in influencing what you're doing that made you stay with it all this time as opposed to do something else uh, when the times got tough? Um, for Dr. Anthony, who, 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 was the, who are those people for you? looking back at your career? Well, that's a great question, because that's a very good question. In fact, I, I, never, I never intended to go into research. Uh, I never intended to do research. I, you know, I was being trained to be a, a clinical doctor, a surgeon, and that's what I wanted to do. And in fact, I still do that. I still spend part of my life uh, taking care of my patients and doing surgery. But when I was actually in my training, uh, there was a doctor who uh, was hiring me for the last stage of my specialty training, and his name is uh, Alan Reddick, and he was a uh, chief of uh, the clinical department at Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and he was mm -hmm. also the surgeon in chief uh, after that. And he called me up and he asked a very, you know, he just said, "Well, you know, this coming year we want you to come and join our program, but we want you to consider doing also a research track in addition to the clinical track." And we're going to give you first choices, if that's what you want to do. 
And he said, and by the way, I think that would be a good thing for you to do. And I said to Dr. Reddick, I said, you know, really, honestly, I really don't want to do that. I just want to do the clinical work. I don't want to do the research track. He said, you know, why don't you think about it? Let me know. You know, I'll call you back in a week. You can give it some thought. But I really think you ought to think seriously about this. I said, okay. So I did. I thought about it seriously. I talked to my colleagues. I talked to my professors. I talked to my wife. And a week later, he called me up and he said, well, I made your decision. Can you do that research track as well? And I really had thought a lot about it. And I said, you know, I really given it a lot of thought. I still only want to do the clinical track. I don't want to do the research. And he said, really? He said, yeah. He said, well, you know, is your wife home? I'd like to say hello. And I said, sure. So he got on the phone with my wife. Five minutes later, he got off the phone. My wife turns to me. She gets off the phone, turns to me and says, you really ought to do that extra research track. And I said, why? I don't want to do that. I just want to do <laughs> clinical work. And he said, well, you know, obviously there's something there that you ought to explore. And sure enough, I explored it. And uh, I love doing the research. I love doing what I, you know, I love doing it. And that's what stuck with me. And now that changed my life. Because here now I'm doing both clinical work as well as my research work, which I really love. And that would have never happened had it not been for that critical moment uh, at that time. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's a great story. And thank goodness they did. <laughs> we wouldn't have all these wonderful discoveries uh, happening in your lab. But um, uh, it, it's, it's really been a, an honor seeing you today, meeting you face to face here, um, really thanking you for everybody that's me watching for everything you're doing and everything you're going to continue to do and wishing you the best uh, of luck with it into the future. Um, everybody watching, once again, uh, it's been Dr. Anthony Atala professor and chair of the Department of Urology at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center, director of the Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine and the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine. Uh, truly amazing things. Everybody obviously check out his websites and the TED Talks and, and everywhere you can find Dr. Tal on the internet because uh, he is truly at the epicenter of everything that regenerative medicine and tissue engineering is all about and all the potential. So uh, once again, Dr. Tal, thank you for your time. Thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Ira. Great being with you today.